So the Mahavidya system, the Desha Mahavidya system, is quite a secret um, tantric tradition which involves in the adoration of Shakti, of the eternal feminine, of the divine feminine. There are a few, four or five main tantric schools, Trika, Kaula, and uh, so forth, Spanda, and one of them is the Mahavidya school. It's a school that's almost, almost uh, disappeared from the world, very, very small uh, places still to find, but it is, in our Atman Federation, extremely alive. It is, let's say, one of the biggest um, initiations and one of the biggest chunks of knowledge that is given in our school. Um, and to understand basically each one of these Mahavidyas represents an aspect of the divine, of God, of the absolute in motion. It is a certain color, a certain flavor of divinity which colors the entire universe. As one of these uh, you asked about uh, grace and Tara and grace and Chinamasta, yes indeed Tara um, is grace. Where there is grace there is Tara. Yes it is this extremely benevolent aspect of God. Christ is there on the cross. Next to Christ there is this thief. He's been such a thief that he gets crucified. He says, oh, I deserve it. I was stealing. I was a thief. But he doesn't deserve it. He is innocent. I testify for him. And he asks Christ, speak nice about me when we go up there. And Christ says, you will be sitting by this evening next to me in my Father's throne over there. You can be a thief all your life, but if you have that humility, sometimes grace can appear. And it's completely improportional for your efforts. With other spiritual powers, like spiritual effort, as it would manifest in Bhairavi, for example, to take from the same system. With other uh, spiritual uh, path, it could take for that thief 1,000 years before he gets to heaven, 10 incarnations. But one instantaneous moment of grace, suddenly you rise like that. Same to take with Paul after killing some people, all of a sudden grace comes, he gets enlightened. Yeah, so grace has this instantaneous transformation which manifests both in Tara as this good parent and in Chinamasta in a very sudden and terrible way. Well, actually the example that you gave, it's sort of a Tara Chinamasta example because yes. you have the, uh, the grace of Jesus in that way, but also the instantaneity of the, um, of the realization of that thief to realize in that moment, and then this is uh, China Master's grace, he cut the mind, he cut the crap, he cut everything stupid that he ever did before, sacrificing it instantaneously to do the right thing, to say, to have the right inner attitude, to say the right words. And then through this instantaneous uh, realization inside of him, whoop, already the grace comes and already he's sitting there on the throne. Yeah, painful on the cross, but still. Uh, it happened in the right moment somehow. If you want a Chinamasta grace story, you can take the Zen story. Blandine likes it very much. Can do. And if she takes over in the middle of the story, I wouldn't mind. So the story goes like this. The, um, there's a master who lives on top of a mountain there in a monastery, and he never speaks. He's a Zen master, and they are a little bit crazy, as we know. And, um, and the only thing that the, this master would ever do would be this. And then he would sit again for a while. And then after some time. And then one of the disciples, he gets asked one day, there comes some uh, traveler or something, and is asking, so they are your guide here, I'm considering, maybe I want to stay a bit in the monastery, but what's the main point of his teaching? And the disciple does like this. 
and the master sees it, takes a huge knife and chops off his finger. So the disciple runs down the hill thinking, oh my God, this master is completely crazy. This is madness. What have they done to me? They've taken my finger away. Oh, running like a mad person down the hill, nearly flipping over his own feet. And then in, in one instant, he just looks back once more in terror to the monastery up on the hill. And there stands the master and he looks down at him and he does like this. And he gets enlightened instantaneously. This is this part. <laughs> Which I love it very much. <laughs> okay, more uh, Mahavidya aspects. Best Mahavidya to alchemize intense sorrow, Tara. Tara. We are all in when agreement. When I had very, very intense sorrow, very, very, like, really, it was such an emotional... Uh, situation that I just I could barely eat and I was just physically with so much pain from the intensity of the negative emotion I really I looked like a my friends look at me says are you a prisoner I just became so thin from uh, the intense of anguish and uh, then I spoke to the other Ava and he said yeah meditate with Tara maybe six hours every day so I meditated with Tara six hours every day and indeed it was life-changing and it, it took a very short time, like just six hours. <laughs> but very few days, and I was just from hell to paradise. So yes, Tara would be the best, and you can sit with her mantra. Actually, it's accessible to sit many hours at a stretch, and somehow all the. So I was suffering so much because I didn't get some points. I was resisting some lessons. And what happens with these long meditations with Tara, you just you sit there and there's this light and the universe and an expansion and Tara and it's so, oh, so beautiful and so nice, hours and hours. And then the insights just come. You just, you get the point already delivered without a thinking process, just the intuitions to the essence. And I remember coming back from this meditation, just telling my brother, this is why I'm suffering so much. This and this and this and this I've been ignoring. And everything became so clear and the suffering went away and I could put my kilograms back in place and so forth. So definitely, if you have the initiation with Tara or at least with the music and with the yantra or just evoke her by name, it's the great savior from suffering. Methods for working with Matangi and in order to find the spiritual mission. So definitely use her yantra and um, there's music available as well. Um, in general, Matangi, as she's already quite to the end of the uh, pantheon there, um, is um, they become more and more, it becomes more and more elusive to, to catch them by their, by the corner of their skirt somehow. And um, Matangi is um, definitely a cosmic power that, that needs you to be quite aware, quite, quite aware. She is this uh, power of wisdom, power of uh, rhythm, the power of integration of everything into one another. It, is, it, it requires a capacity to really zoom out. And then it, all of a sudden, all makes sense. This is basically what Matangi is about. So... If you don't have initiation into her mantra yet, again, you can use yantras, music, and so forth. But also you can work with the first mantra, with Shiva mantra, and become more and more aware. And this capacity of being aware and then looking attentively at your life. If, for example, you're looking for purpose. Looking attentively at your own being, at your talents, at your wonderful hidden qualities. Looking very attentively at each situation as it unfolds. It can help you to gradually flirt with the manifestations of Matangi. Also within our yoga school we do a monthly um, big ceremony for revealing the life's mission due to the grace of Matangi. I'm sure it's uh, offered there in, uh, in the school in Denmark or if you are in another school you can ask them if they are offering it. Um, that can be very helpful and we are soon having a purpose workshop coming up. Yes, mid-October, 15th of October, we will have five-day uh, meaning and 
purpose in life and then you'll have many exercises and many lectures to understand this purpose of life and uh, yeah by now it's already five years we go with this so four or five years and many many hundreds of people and they had very wonderful results on this uh, on this path of purpose and it will be available also online yeah it will be available online uh, and by the way to find your spiritual mission practice practice at least four or five hours a day and in time you will reveal your spiritual mission but this is a is a starting point like I don't know what is your situation but oftentimes I hear people asking about their spiritual mission and they practice an hour per day it's pointless it's not even the time to reveal it yet practice properly and have some deep revelations and understandings of your life and of yourself and what you want and how how much you really want to walk the spiritual path and so forth and then the spiritual mission will reveal itself um, for this uh, question that you had, which Mahavidya best to trans transcend and transform abuse and trauma, also Tara. Also Tara. Same, same. And then the relevance of the pairings. Yeah. So in general, for these, uh, if you are very interested in the in the cosmic powers into the Mahavidya system, it will be very much recommended um, to go to the Mahavidya camps that uh, Advaita and Adina are offering uh, every year. And um, this gives you a very deep insight. Even if you haven't been that far in the course yet, you can have a lot of deep understandings to, um, uh, on the subject. Um, and uh, they have also written books about the Mahavidyas, which are very much recommended to, to read as well, to understand it more. Um, the pairings of the Mahavidyas are uh, due to the fact that those cosmic forces that are paired together, they operate together as well. They have um, functions, let's say, within this universe that need to come together. So one pairing, for example, is Kali and Bhuvaneshwari, time and space. And this is something you even know from physics. And physics, time is even not called time, it's called space-time, because by now we know that they are completely interlinked. You cannot think of space without time and you cannot think of time without space. So therefore there's a pairing because principally they belong together. And then the same for, uh, for all the other couples. They always um, belong, belong together in a sensible way. The great emptiness, the great void of Dumavati gives rise to the great plenitude and abundance of Kamalatmika. So, they, they come paired in this way because uh, they occur together, they have functions together. Meantime, I will answer about uh, uh, Zodiac and Enneagram. So, um, there is uh, the Zodiac and the Enneagram are both systems of, um, of archetypes, if you will, specific nuances of um, manifestations of the soul. Um, specifically on the astral structure, so specifically related to how uh, our mind operates, how our emotions operate, and therefore how we tend to behave. This, this, these are these uh, systems you are addressing. Therefore, there are some correlations. You could say that, for example, uh, a number eight that is known to be more on the uh, bossy side but also having available this uh, very, very easy access to heroism will probably resonate with Kali. Also typically uh, number eight is uh, very free about their sexuality, very, even very loud and visible and in your face about it and so forth. All of this lends itself that they definitely will have an easier time to relate to Kali. But this is not to say that these can be correlated with one another one-to-one, -one, not at all. The Mahavidyas are accessible to any human being, no matter when they were born or what is their inner situation. And um, uh, a number eight might need to uh, pray to Tara as much as any, any other uh, one and might actually have as their main resonance of a cosmic power a completely different one than Kali. So they should not just be put one-on-one -on -one like that. It is more that there are due to certain personality traits, there will be affinities. It is probably for a fire sign in general, 
easy to relate to a fiery cosmic power like Bhairavi. That doesn't mean it is their main cosmic power. It doesn't mean that some fire signs, they will have a total blockage with that because they can do all the fiery things, but not the sacrifice and the effort that Bhairavi asks for. So there are only some mild correlations, but it shouldn't be put one-on-one -on -one at all. Yes, and as for if you want to tell your students why the practice with the cosmic power with the cosmic powers work. Um, it's the same way that uh, our skin, when exposed to the sun, releases vitamin D. So it's like we can direct ourselves to the sun of compassion. And when we meditate with the mantra and so forth of Tara, we are in contact. Whatever is open inside of us, we are is in contact with that universal compassion. And that universal compassion will create in us a kind of vitamin D, a kind of quality inside, and that compassion can alchemize our suffering. Or if we avoid life, avoid transformation, avoid errors, avoid the thought of our death, we cling to things and we are so attached to everything. If we meditate with the great sun, with the great cosmic power, Kali, and we just stay exposed, we stand in front of this universal power of time, of transformation, of change, of death, it will click something inside of us. Oh, I'm going to die one day. I can't carry all of this. Maybe I... Stop carrying some of that. Maybe I detach. I need to transform. I have to transform. I get an urge to transform. Yeah, because you are close to that particular cosmic influence. As the tides of the seas are depending on the position of the moon, so we can position ourselves in front of energies bigger than the sun and bigger than the moon. And through these mantras and yantras and rituals and practices of the cosmic powers, we expose ourselves like a satellite dish to catch that particular influence. And then it will have all these beneficial effects on us. It's like a fluid, an energy that creates this transformation in us. Hey guys, if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more content on spirituality, tantra and more. And if you want to sign up for our online classes or for our retreats, you can see our website on the description below.